I'm Shannon Simel, and I'm uh, pleased to welcome you to our mini conference, St. Louis School Library Year in Review. And so um, I am the Future Ready Librarian from Live for Life Academy. And um, it's been my pleasure to be your host um, for this morning's sessions. If you missed any of our sessions, they're going to be uploaded to my uh, YouTube channel later, which is PD Bytes. Um, I'd like to have JP introduce himself first because he's been our co-host for uh, this morning's learning. Hey, Shannon. So first, thank you so much for inviting me to co-host this event with you. I'm glad I've had the opportunity to uh, learn from some amazing library media specialists from around the area. My name is JP Presveno. I serve the Fox School District down in Arnold as the Instructional Technology Coordinator. Uh, part of my role is facilitating the work of the Library Media Specialist PLC. Um, I, lead our, I lead the meetings, um, guide the PD, and serve kind of as a liaison between library and administration and everything in between. Feel free to connect with me on Twitter at JP Prez, and you can follow my blog at jpprez.com. Great. So our last session of the day is a panel discussion about what it means to be a 21st century librarian and how our jobs have changed. Um, so I'd like to start off just by giving everyone an opportunity to give us a quick intro to who you are, what you do, and sort of the 30 second elevator speech version of uh, library success that you've had um, from this year. So let's start with Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Head. I am the Library Media Specialist at Francis House Central High School. I'm also the content leader for the librarians in the district. Um, as far as probably successes this year, things that we probably are most proud of, we started the, definitely what I would say is a future ready movement is real world Wednesdays. We're really trying to uh, get some skills set aside for the kids to learn they don't get in the classroom so every month we would focus on during their what we call seminar time you know classroom times um, some real world skill like one time it was how to change the oil in your car or where do you uh, put the air in the tire or things like that and so it was a great way to bring in our community uh, we had the uh, actually an auto repair it was right in front of our school he got a car nice uh, dodge charger from Lou Hughes and brought it over, the kids were really into it. Uh, one time we had somebody come and talk about resumes and how to write a proper resume. We did just some um, things around Christmas, some little craft things that they could make cheap, you know, for their parents when you, you're on a budget. So uh, we hope it'll be, you know, more successful even next year. Uh, you, that's the kind of program that you really grow. Parents, the feedback we've gotten from parents on a survey is that uh, please make it mandatory. <laughs> so uh, I know that we have parent support and our administrators love it. Uh, it's just continuing to get the word out to get more students. Great, Andrea, thank you. Uh, next up is Kim. Hello, I am Kim Linskog and I work in the Parkway School District um, as the support specialist for librarians. And I think Primarily, I'm working with the efficacy around the national frameworks um, this year, especially with the Future Ready and um, Project Connect and the ISTE standards and how they fit into our whole program guidelines that we came up with from our evaluation last year. Great. Thank you, Kim. Next up is Amy Peach. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Peach. I am Assistant Professor of Education at Lindenwood. And... Um, I teach uh, research, leadership, innovation. I chair the library and media program, um, and I help guide the activities of the Idea Studio, which is um, an, a tech and innovative practice lab here on campus. And I think that in the last year, uh, the thing that we have spending a great deal of time on is revamping uh, the what was a um, traditional DESI followed um, library media program, and we revamped it into something that was a little bit more responsive to student needs. Uh, what we found is that people who come to us who want to become school librarians come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some of them have extensive experience 
um, as English teachers or as just, you know, really avid readers. Uh, others, I, I have a, a strange influx of math teachers uh, that are coming in and, and wanting to be part of school libraries. And I think that what's exciting about that is that that's really reflective of the work that all of you are doing, that there wouldn't have been, you know, teachers in other areas that would have even thought that that would be something for them if all of you didn't make it into such a, a central, robust, exciting place for learning in the school. And so what we had to do was divide up the program so that students have electives, they have options, they can, they all have to learn the basics of library media, but if they need more help with the technology, they can get that. If they need more experience with the literature, then they can get that. And so that's been, um, and so far we've, we've, had, we've had good results. The students um, have really been able to, to assess their own strengths and weaknesses, and uh, hopefully we're turning out really great uh, library media specialists for the schools. Thank you, Amy, for growing new librarians and also for your advocacy work with uh, Desi. We really appreciate that. Let's try uh, Kelly next. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Oliva. I'm the librarian at Liberty High School in the Wentzville School District. And if I had to talk about one success from this year, I talked about teacher badging earlier in this particular um, workshop and I would say that I have had just an amazing opportunity to connect with some teachers outside of just the English department through badging this year. I have developed a, a really close relationship with one of our math teachers and I don't think that would have happened unless we had tried badging at our school. So that is just an awesome success story because you know we don't typically, typically get a lot of math teachers that frequent our door here in the library. Great, thank you Kelly. Next up is Victoria. Hi, um, I am Victoria Jones. I'm the Library Media Specialist at Wydown Middle School in the School District of Clayton and the uh, Library Coordinator for the district. Um, we also instituted a makerspace. We're having, on our early release days, we're having a pursuit day where students can kind of choose to investigate whatever they want. And um, we've we had more than a third of the school choose makerspace as an option that um, <laughs> they wanted. So we have about uh, 200 students go through our makerspace, um, different sessions throughout the day, and it's been really successful. So next year we're hoping to um, expand. And a lot of kids are wanting to start after school clubs and activities based on some of the things that they've learned during the makerspace. So that's always rewarding when kids want to take the idea and run with it even more. Okay, uh, next up is Mindy. Hi, I'm Mindy Botkin. I've been a librarian at Orchard Farm High School for 15 years. Um, I'm also the content leader for the librarian department in our district, and I serve on the district technology committee. And um, our library has changed so much in the last few years um, with more of a, a focus on uh, personal interests and personal learning, expanding their horizons and things that are personal interest to them and the things that they're passionate about. And so um, incorporating a lot of things with makerspace and, and um, all different kinds of opportunities with the community and things like that to expand their horizons. Thank you, Mindy. Next up is Carolyn. I'm Carolyn Allen. I am the Library Media Specialist at Lawson Elementary in the Hazelwood School District. And I would say one of the successes I've had this year in the library is just really diving in more with the maker activities. Um, we don't have any anything hugely structured as far as like anything like Victoria mentioned, like a hundreds of kids running through a makerspace at a time, but um, that's definitely kind of been a focus and um, definitely something we're gonna continue. And I think collaboration is gonna be my next, my next goal that I'm gonna focus on next year. So I believe JP has our first question for you guys. Yeah, thanks Shannon. So, you know, earlier, I think Andrea, in one of our earlier sessions, you were talking about how your role has changed. Um, how 10 years ago everything was about librarians and checking out books and I remember that from earlier in my teaching career um, but so my real question is how has your role the role of the librarian really evolved over the last five or so years and I guess we'll just start and I'm gonna start with the top of my screen who's Kelly Well, I would absolutely agree with you that in, in five years, my gosh, we've started to add so much more technology into our libraries. And I think if you're not a librarian who feels particularly techie, 
you, you need to figure out how to get techie <laughs> because it's it's something that our students need us to help with. It's, it's a logical place for us to provide tech help. So um, about three years ago, we added some green screen rooms to our library. We were really fortunate when they built our space to add study rooms. And I think those were really supposed to be used as study rooms, but they've all been converted to green screen rooms. And, and um, you know, we're looking at adding some better audio equipment and just kind of going with whatever the next trend is. Is it podcasting? What kind of equipment do we need to have available for that? So um, it's exciting at the same time because things change so quickly. And I'm really anxious to be able to to share with my students, hey, this is what's what's new, and you guys can play with this and, and see what you can do with it. And they just, they're they impress me so much with the videos that they create and just their creativity in general. Oh, awesome! Very cool, um, Andrea. You're the next one down on my screen. Do you, can you talk a little bit about how your roles changed over the last five years? Uh, one of the things that I think that we see more of is that we are PD leaders in our building. Um, there's um, Sometimes districts have specific people for, for that, but I'm seeing more and more librarians reaching out to share PD on technology, new resources. Uh, it can be reading, and I think that we wear so many hats, and that's why we can share on so many different items. You know, it could be digital citizenship. Uh, there's just tons that we can do, which builds that collaboration, but it's leading beyond the library, whether that's in your own building or in your area, either one. Awesome, great. Uh, Kim, you're the next one on my list. Can you talk a little bit about how, how your roles change, changed in the last five years? Or how, I guess how you've observed the roles of the librarians you work with? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, like when Bill and I both came into the position, which was about five years ago, uh, we started asking the question, what does it mean to be a librarian in the digital age? And kind of moving forward, like it's not a destination, it's gonna be a journey. And that journey is always going to be there, but I think it's changed in a fact that we're thinking about it in terms of services and being participatory. Um, what more can we do? How can we be that, you know, like that mentor of digital citizenship, like, uh, like Andrea was talking about. And I think overall it's like becoming that purpose based place where you're, you're indispensable to the community. And thinking about that in terms of, you know, like Andrea was also talking about the instructional, being an instructional partnership, all those wedges from Future Ready have really given us a great map to what it is that librarians do. And you can kind of, I think librarians can find their niche in that framework and then move forward from there. So start where you already feel pretty comfortable and then start stepping out of that comfort zone to keep your role moving forward. Awesome. I think that's really, that's really key, Kim, to be able to kind of start, start with, start and focus on your strengths and grow a little at a time. Cause I could, you know, I can see folks who maybe are popping in today and saying, Oh my gosh, there's, there's badging and there's, and there's making and there's technology and Oh my gosh. And there's green screens. I have to be able to do all of this by <laughs> three o'clock, you know, but it's really folks, right. Play to your strengths and, and grow a little bit at a time, get good at something and focus on something else. Mm-hmm. Amy, can you talk a little bit about um, how you've seen the role of librarians change the last five years? Uh, sure, sort of. So it's good that I'm actually. And, I, and I'm not sure how long you've been you've been working with them. So I, so I so gave it, the can you. Yeah, actually, I, I I'm good. It's good that I'm tagging you know on the back of Kim, and I was just tweeting what she was saying because I I couldn't agree more there. Um, so Bill Bill Bass and I have you know sort of been uh, commiserating about this because we both came largely from technology innovation side of it, and so when I was asked to come on to Lindenwood. Um, it was because they were developing, you know, an innovation lab, and uh, they, I thought the dean was a little bit nuts, you know, when she wanted me to also uh, help drive the, the library media. And she said, trust me, just look at what you do in your last learning center and tell me how it's different. And when I actually looked at the structure, I thought, you know what, it's really pretty astonishing that modern libraries are centers where students as individuals can find their full expression as people. And that is kind of the, the belief that drives everything that I do here. And that quite often um, comes through through books. Uh, we talk about bibliotherapy, we talk about elements of literature that can help students connect to who they are, how they can develop empathy through things like that. But it's also about maybe how technology can do that, how learning, uh, 
Do you use, you know, people have mentioned green screen several times. How can you let your creative, you know, side out in, in this way? And so finding the, um, I've really been very impressed with the way that it, this whole model has been created where we have these centers for learning where students can look at it as individuals. In our classrooms, they tend to get lost. They're one of 20, they're one of 30, and it can be very hard for them to find their voice uh, and their identity in an environment like that. But libraries where personalized learning and problem-based learning can really, really thrive, uh, those are centers that we really, really need to appreciate and understand. Oh, that's all. That's awesome. Uh, you know, I, I, the last thing I heard you say was the person, the library is the center for personalized learning. I just think that's really, a, that's really a key that we have this opportunity in these amazing spaces, you know, in our learning commons or the, the central point of learning or whatever your district calls, calls the library now. It's just this great opportunity and an amazing space to give kids exactly what they need. And Victoria, do you want to, can you talk a little bit about how your roles changed the last few years? Sure. Um, I think that we've become less givers of information and um, more, um, I guess, partners along the, along the road for technology. I, I think one of the things that a lot of teachers have to overcome, and it's something that we try to help our students overcome as well, and as librarians we can be a model, is to not be afraid of these new um, technologies and, and uh, new ideas and to embrace them and this idea that if you fail, it's really just the you know, beginning of some new kinds of learning and that failure is, is definitely an option because it's probably gonna happen over and over again. So um, like get rid of those perfectionistic kinds of attitudes maybe that some teachers and students have had and um, embrace what's coming down the pike. I think that's been a hump that some of the librarians and teachers and students in my district have um, really had to overcome. And I think as librarians, we can be the models for that. Hey, we'll try this with you and then, then you know, we can figure it out together. And so I think that collaborative piece, again, that you talked about in your last session um, is, is really helpful as well. Absolutely, that collaboration. I, you know, the letting teachers and students see that we're that we're a partner in education, and that we're willing to have that first attempt in learning right along with them is so incredibly important. Uh, Mindy, what, what are your thoughts on how how your roles changed in the last few years? Um, my role has changed tremendously, and, and I would say um, a lot of the similar things that others have said. Um, we are definitely more than just finding a book to read or resources for research. We're so much more now about programs, events, activities, things that support um, what they're already learning in their classroom and maybe taking it a step farther. Um, and a lot more student voice on what it is that they want to learn, what do they want to know more about, what do they want to participate in. So um, uh, I think the students have more opportunity now than when I became a librarian 15 years ago to pursue their personal interests and their hobbies and expand upon things more that, that they're passionate about. So I, I think that's the primary way I see my role has changed. Oh, that's awesome. I, I think that's great that you're able to use your space to give students a voice. And finally, I think, I think Melissa, you're the only, only person I haven't heard from yet. Um, how's your role changed in the last couple of years? Well, first, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I actually came from the science classroom a couple of years ago, um, and I came in knowing that my position was going to be heavy with technology. And so, um, you know, we've created a Northwest High School, a video production room. We have a music production room, and we're working on flexible seating. And so I came from a district that had a lot of very traditional librarians and have really pushed that role to inc incorporating makerspace and making it an area that students can come in and easily be able to switch up the furniture however they need it. And that's probably been my big biggest success this year and what we're working on for next year is to really make a space that students can collaborate easily in where they may not be able to do that in another area in the school. So um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of combine a few questions uh, for our Yeah, last. please do. 
So, um, you know, with the new a ASL standards and with Future Ready Framework, um, you know, the, the role of the librarian has um, changed in a lot of ways. And so um, what I'm wondering about is what strategies um, that you have as far, each of you, as far as balancing your time, um, you know, what, how do you figure out where your priorities and your focus are and what you can let go of? Um, if you have any strategies for that, I would just love um, to hear from everyone. So I'll start with Amy. Um, well, from our end, I think that the, in looking actually probably more at the new AASL standards um, than future ready, although these things all kind of weave in together. Um, but, you know, I think our focus right now is really on incorporating diversity in an effective way. Uh, it's still very, I mean, all of us are, are in the St. Louis region, at least who are here right now. Uh, people who are watching later may not be, but um, it's, it's still incredibly frustrating that we are this many years outside of Ferguson and uh, still having, still struggling with this, with this issue as a region. And I think that um, library media specialists are in a really, really unique position to do something about it. And they're so compassionate and so passionate about, passionate about their children and about the materials and, and um, providing great information that this is something that I think we can, we can work on in a way that is very meaningful. We have so many tools at our disposal. So we're spending time looking at some of the different classes in terms of how are we integrating these tools? How are we paying attention to these issues that are important to us, not just the different tools that are being used, but are they, or are we being culturally responsive to, you know, specific elements of it? And so I know what I have to do over the next year is uh, all of our classes are online hybrid option. And so I have to start um, incorporating uh, outcomes related to that, tie them to all of our assignments and content in our classes so that I can then extract that data and see how we're doing really um, in that respect. We can talk about it anecdotally all day long, but if I have some really solid numbers, you know, I think that's really going to help. The other thing that we did over the last semester, and I'll mention it because I, we have at least two of the people that we had site visits uh, with are here today. So Mindy and Melissa, thank you so much again. Um, but part of our, our challenge with our students is getting them out of their libraries, the way that the programs are structured. They tend to do their practicum hours in the library where they teach, and that doesn't really help them to understand what it's like to teach in an urban school or a charter school or a rural school. And so getting them out in to those fields so that they can hear from Melissa about the things that have gone well there and the challenges that they've had, being able to talk to Mindy about her experiences at Orchard Farm and um, to be able to get them physically out and to see and to talk to other people so that they can get those experiences. And then hopefully that will translate to uh, their collections and that's where we're at right now with that. Thank you, Amy. I, you know, I know uh, Carolyn and uh, Andrea were talking earlier about diversity in the collection being um, definitely a trend that they saw at the Maslow Spring Conference. So um, thank you for bringing that to our attention. So I'm gonna throw it to Victoria uh, next. And so we were talking about uh, how do you balance your role? What do you have to let go of? Um, how has, have the new standards changed your work? So I, I think uh, I really do try to prioritize every year in the summer. I try to look at, you know, what are the initiatives that are coming on? What is central office um, expecting me to accomplish? What is my principal? What are the priorities, you know, as far as um, what's going on in the school? I look at those and then look also at some areas where I see that we need some growth and, and really try to, um, you know, put them in the order that I think uh, they deserve attention. I ask a lot of my colleagues about, you know, what their thoughts are about that as well. Um, and I do think some of the tools that, you, that a lot of people have talked about today um, are really helpful in helping me manage my time and try to be in multiple places at once, like being a co-teacher on Google Classroom and uh, for many, many teachers, and then also uh, having lots of screencasts. Thank you, Shannon, for introducing that in my life many, many years ago. Um, that's really helped me kind of be in more than one place at a time. Yeah, if you want to know more about that and you didn't catch JP's session, uh, be sure to watch on YouTube because uh, Victoria shared that strategy and JP had a lot more of the, the Google tools. Um, so next, I'm going to throw it to Mindy. 
Um, I think most librarians would probably agree the two things we have the least of are time and money. Um, and, and time management is, is definitely um, a struggle because I think we never have enough time and money to do all the things that we would really like to do for the kids. Um, but I usually use the kids as um, the priority that I use to decide what gets done when things are getting really overwhelming is um, what benefits the kids most on that list. Um, but without to-do lists and post-it notes, I'm not sure how I would survive. But um, they, they often joke about all the to-do lists and the post-it notes, but um, they keep us organized. And um, another thing that is really beneficial to me is having student helpers. And um, this year I created a library advisory board and that board not only gave students a voice in what we offered in the library, but they also come in and help me. And they do um, a lot of tasks that free up a lot of time for me. And I just love those kids. And they work so hard for me. And um, I, I couldn't do what I do without them. So um, I would suggest trying to incorporate students into your library as much as you can. Great. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, next is Melissa. Um, we have tried to work with both of our teachers and our students. And so for our teachers, um, we do a lot of the tech work here and so we send out a needs assessment um, to be able to get information from our teachers on what we want and I use the same thing screens um, I'm making digital workbooks over the summer for some of our tech stuff um, and then with our students we also send out a survey and we have a, a library advisory board it is slowly starting but they give us a lot of feedback on what we need to put into the library they've kind of pushed where we have added many of our things in. So I think making sure that I have student voice and teacher voice in with everything I do has helped me prioritize what I need to work on at that time. Melissa and Mindy, I think you guys both make a great point about that. It's a lesson I've had to learn is, you know, if a program's not working and I'm not getting participation, instead of trying to push it, I need to like step back and think about like, okay, what do the kids want to do instead? Uh, I'll throw it over to Andrea next. I would say there, there's two things that, um, you know, I have a partner, there's two of us here, and one tool that we use tremendously is Google Keep. Um, that kind of lets us play off of each other. We can keep a joint list of those post-it notes like Mindy was talking about. You have to have those to-do lists. Uh, but instead of just dividing everything down the middle, it's kind of like what comes next, then you can prioritize. And then you can archive that list. You know, I have a beginning of the year, this is things that needs to be done at the beginning of the year. Here's things we need to do at the end of the year. And so uh, by being able to archive those lists on Google Keep, it's like being able to recycle. The other thing is uh, we're in our, I guess, fourth year of Epsilon Beta, which is a, a state of Missouri thing. But uh, Epsilon Beta is for high school students who love the library and want to assist in what we do. And so that's um, we've got a, an active club of students that help us when we have Teen Read Week or uh, Teen Tech Week and all those things. We can't be and do all those things. So the students really come up with some great ideas. They might do some bulletin boards, some promotions. They go into the cafe. And so when we can't be there, they're our voice for us. And really, when you're at the high school level, that is huge because they're, they're better at getting the kids involved sometimes than we are. So those are two things that we rely on to, to get things done. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Sorry. I think it's so easy to get overwhelmed, especially with ISTE standards, AASL standards, Future Ready Library Initiative. And I would just say, if you can maximize all the opportunities we have in this area for professional development, there are so many. and. I steal ideas from people all the time. So I don't feel obligated to come up with new ideas every single year. I'm connecting with you guys. I'm taking notes as I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm thinking about how I need to send out a survey to my staff and probably my students as well about what they want me to prioritize for next year. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to go to Google Summit and the Ed Camps. And I mean, if I, if I follow people on Twitter, they, there are so many librarians with great ideas and so I steal as much as I possibly can from them and I feel like the technology available to us today makes it easy for you to, to take an idea and really simply make it into something that works for your own space. 
So that's one of the ways that, that I'm dealing with that. So Kelly, um, you did a whole session for us earlier on how to, to steal those great ideas. And, and I'm having a brainstorm now between your session and JP's. I think we need to make a Google Classroom that we can all join um, for St. Louis librarians. So I'm hoping you'll push that out uh, through your greater St. Louis. So um, we'll have to do that, I think, with our personal Gmails. But let, let's get that started. Um, and we'll share the link out for anyone else that wants to participate um, so that we can uh, share the share the the joys of all of our stuff that we're doing and not have to reinvent the wheel. It's an awesome idea. Okay, uh, Kim, you're gonna wrap it up for us and we've got less than a minute and so I'll say goodbye and thank you right now before <laughs> uh, Kim uh, wraps this up for us. Uh, I, th I think the strategy as far as figuring out what it is that you wanna prioritize uh, is thinking about the collective capacity. How can I reach as many students as possible? It's not gonna be through students. Um, it's kind of the advice we've had for our librarians. So let's reach out to our teachers um, and build that partnership because you're going to touch a whole lot of a lot more students than you are trying to touch every single student. Um, and I think the other thing is sometimes we don't know what we spend our time on. And if we take the time to do a Google form and create the data, then you're going to be able to figure out where your priorities are. So I think that has really helped people justify their actions and determine the priorities. Um, and it only takes maybe once a week or something like that. If you don't have time for that, take a screenshot of your, um, your Google Drive. It'll tell you exactly what you've been working on all year. If you took it once a week, once every two weeks, I look back and see what I was doing in October. I'm like, oh yeah. So I think those are some tips. <laughs>